Hi everyone, in today's tutorial I'm going to talk about the choroid plexus. We'll start with a little bit of anatomy and embryology, talk about cerebral spinal fluid, and then focus on what makes up the choroid plexus, how it develops, and then we'll finish up with some clinical pearls. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, the histology wizard. Let's start with a little bit of embryology. Within the brain, there are cavities or ventricles which develop from the neural tube, and you can see them here in orange. While the walls of the neural tube become the vesicles that form different parts of the brain, that middle hollow part, the neural canal, will expand into these ventricles that will later be filled with cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. Here you see an image, a sagittal section through the brain, with those cavities colored in. The first largest set of cavities are the yellow lateral ventricles, one within each of the cerebral hemisphere. Next, we have the third ventricle in orange, bounded by the thalamus and hypothalamus, that communicates with the lateral ventricles through the interventricular foramina, or foramina of Monroe. The cerebral aqueduct, seen in red, is a narrow channel through the midbrain that connects the third and fourth ventricles. And the fourth ventricle, shown in pink, is an enlarged cavity at the level of the pons in the medulla, and it's overlain by the cerebellum. And this last image shows all of the ventricles labeled, plus the central canal of the spinal cord. Now here's an interesting image. It's actually a 3D rendering of those ventricles. And now we can better appreciate the ventricles and their connections. So looking from top to bottom, we see the lateral ventricles in blue, in cyan, you can see those two interventricular foramina. In yellow, we see the third ventricle. In red, that cerebral aqueduct. In purple, we have the fourth ventricle. And the green shows that central canal of the spinal cord. Now, all of these cavities contain cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. But what exactly is that fluid? Well, essentially, this fluid is an ultrafiltrate of plasma. It has many functions. It cushions the brain against the skull. It reduces the effective weight of the brain, which can lessen the force applied to brain tissue and cerebral vessels if there's mechanical injury. It also keeps the brain environmentally stable, which is critical for maintaining normal neuronal function. And it provides protection, nourishment, and waste removal for brain tissue. I'd like to just touch on how CSF is collected which happens in a procedure called a lumbar puncture, or you may have heard it called a spinal tap. Here are a couple of images of a patient during a lumbar puncture. So typically the patient will be lying on their side and a hollow needle will be inserted into the spinal cord to collect the CSF. And this next image shows the CSF actually coming out of the spinal cord into a container. Why do we even collect CSF? Well, it turns out that CSF sampling can be used to diagnose diseases of the brain and spinal cord and other conditions that might affect the central nervous system. This can include infectious diseases of the brain and spinal cord, things you've heard of like meningitis, encephalitis. It also tests for infections looking at white blood cell, bacteria, other substances in the cerebral spinal fluid. This analysis can give information about autoimmune disorders, about bleeding or hemorrhages in the brain, and even brain tumors. Now let's look at this lumbar puncture procedure in just a bit more detail. Here's a cartoon showing a side view of a person with the spinal cord and vertebrae shown. Now a lumbar puncture is going to take place between two of the lumbar vertebrae, hence the name, usually between the third and the fourth or the fourth and the fifth lumbar vertebrae. How exactly does this work? Well, a large hollow needle is inserted into the spinal cord. So let's magnify this area to look closer and magnify it again so that we can really see where the needle is inserted. Let's get oriented. Here we have our vertebrae, our spinous processes, and the dura mater, that outermost meningeal layer that surrounds and protects the brain and the spinal cord. Now the area where we see this needle inserted is into a space called the subarachnoid space, and that's where CSF is circulating. So that's how you collect the fluid but what actually makes CSF? Well, it turns out that a structure called the choroid plexus is the secretory tissue that produces CSF. It develops at four sites in the roof of the neural tube in the lateral third and fourth ventricles shortly after neural tube closure. 
Now here we're looking at an H&E stain section of brain tissue. Here we see a bit of one of the folia of the cerebellum, and the white space you see here is the fourth ventricle. And this oval is enclosing part of the choroid plexus. Now we can look a little bit closer at a different example where you can see the numerous folds of the villi and a whole lot of blood vessels. Now let's take an even closer look at that tissue using a cartoon. This cartoon represents just a portion of the choroid plexus. I want to point out three components. This capillary representing the meningeal blood vessels, the pia mater, which is that meningeal layer closest to the brain tissue, and a layer of cells called ependymal cells whose apical surfaces face the ventricle. We'll talk about these structures in more detail, but now I want to talk a little bit about the functions of the choroid plexus using that same cartoon. As I mentioned, the choroid plexus serves to cushion and protect, but it also turns out that it has critical metabolic functions. First, the cells of the choroid plexus produce and secrete CSF which forms as a filtrate from the capillaries of the choroid plexus, and the ependymal cells then transform it into CSF. So it's got a lot of goodies, ions, glucose, oxygen, and vitamins, all the things that the brain needs for its metabolism. Another critical function of the choroid plexus is to exchange molecules in and out of the brain. The removal of metabolic waste takes place particularly when we sleep. But what kind of things are actually removed? Well, it turns out that all sorts of unnecessary molecules, such as peroxidation products, glycosylated proteins, excess neurotransmitters, debris from the brain and the ventricles, bacteria, viruses, all sorts of things are removed. This helps prevent the accumulation of these molecules, which interferes with neuronal functioning of the brain. And we know this because we tend to see accumulation of these products in aging and in some neurodegenerative diseases. So it turns out that sleep really is important for your long-term health. Now the choroid plexus also regulates the travel of immune cells. Within this tissue, but not shown in this cartoon, are a whole bunch of different immune cells, microglia, white blood cells, macrophages, lymphocytes. All of these serve to prevent harmful pathogens from entering the brain tissue. This also prevents normal brain homeostasis. Cytokines are produced by the choroid plexus that help recruit these immune cells. Last, but certainly not least, the choroid plexus functions to form the blood CSF barrier. These ependymal cells, like all epithelial cells, contain tight junctions at their apical ends. And these junctions, if you remember, form a seal a lot like a seal on your water bottle that prevents leakage of ions and water between the cells. And we call that paracellular transport. Importantly, the structure of the choroid plexus ensures that some substances leave the capillaries but can't enter the CSF. So now let's talk about how CSF is actually made. And we'll look a little closer at those ependymal cells. So here's a cartoon showing what's happening on a cellular level within the choroid plexus looking at just a row of cells. So let's get oriented. First, we have the lumen of the ventricle. Remember, this is where we're gonna see the CSF secreted. Next, we see those ependymal cells, which will secrete the CSF. And these ependymal cells have desmosomes that link them tightly together, basal lateral membranes with lots of folds to increase the surface area for absorption, and microvilli on their apical surfaces and some have cilia as shown here. Some of these cells are called tanocytes and they're specialized. They have basal processes that form very strong end feet on the capillaries. Now next we see the pia mater, that connective tissue layer, and the interstitial space with fluid. And finally we see our fenestrated capillary. Now remember that these capillaries have large windows or holes between the endothelial cells. They have fewer tight junctions, so a lot of things can pass through them. And this is one of the main differences between the blood CSF barrier and the blood brain barrier. The choroid plexus barrier is an exchanger and the fenestrations thus allow more things to move in and out. In contrast, the capillaries in the blood brain barrier are not fenestrated. They have a lot of tight junctions because their job is to keep things out of the brain. 
Next, we see some important channels required for CSF production, particularly the sodium potassium ATPase situated on the apical brush border of the ependymal cells. The other important component to point out are those tight junctions between ependymal cells. Remember, those seals are going to help prevent leakage between the cells. Now that we're oriented, let's walk through how CSF is made. So the hydrostatic pressure in capillaries, remember that's the pushing pressure, it produces a net flow of water, solutes, and proteins that enter the interstitial space and then into the ependymal cells. Next, that sodium-potassium pump is going to pump sodium into the lumen of the ventricle, and this is going to produce an osmotic gradient that's going to facilitate the diffusion of water from the cell into the extracellular space to make CSF. Now, remember how we talked about the blood CSF barrier? Well, it turns out that a lot of substances can leave the blood, but can't get into the CSF. Why can't they get in? Well, remember those tight junctions. Those help keep these components inside the cells, so they kind of direct the traffic in a one-way direction. And those basolateral folds also help keep some components from entering the ependymal cells and thus keep them out of the CSF. And that's the blood CSF barrier. Now, so far we've talked about the brain ventricles, the choroid plexus, what it does, and how CSF is made. But let's throw a little embryology in there and talk about how this super cool complex structure actually develops. Well, the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle, it turns out, is the first to appear, around nine weeks of gestation. And then that's followed by simultaneous development of the choroid plexus in the lateral and third ventricles. During this time, those ependymal cells of the choroid plexus are going to secrete high amounts of protein, and that creates a colloid osmotic pressure that permits the brain to actually expand, which is pretty cool. So let's walk through a simplified version of choroid plexus development. And there are three major players, the meningeal blood vessels, the pia mater, and the ependyma, which is made up of the ependymal cells as well as those specialized ependymal cells called the tanocytes. And note those tight junctions in purple between the cells. Now the choroid plexus forms in a very similar way to alveoli of the lung and also to placental villi. And this actually makes a lot of sense because all of these tissues, placental villi, lung alveoli, and the choroid plexus, they're all exchangers, meaning they need to have very close relationship with blood vessels. Next, the developing vessels begin to invaginate into the ventricle roof, and they kind of push the tissue into forming finger-like folds or villi. The choroid plexus folds into many villi around each capillary, creating frond-like processes and that project into the ventricles. Now these villi, just as in the small intestine, along with the brush border of microvilli, greatly increase the surface area of the choroid plexus. And this tissue can produce up to 500 milliliters of CSF per day in the adult human brain, which is darn remarkable. And this next image simply shows the process all put together. How about some examples of what the choroid plexus looks like under the microscope? Here's a low power view of a section of choroid plexus where you can see the infoldings of the villi and a magnified view shows the closely opposed blood vessels and the ependymal cells. In a different section, again, note the many folded villi that provide a lot of surface area for secretion and absorption. And this magnified view shows the ependymal cells again. Now, unfortunately, it's pretty difficult to see the brush border on these cells in most sections, but you can sort of see that some of them have a little bit of a fuzz on the top. So once CSF is made, how does it actually flow in the brain? Here's a sagittal section of the brain again, and I've labeled the ventricles here, the lateral, third, the cerebral aqueduct, and the fourth. Next, you can see the location of the choroid plexus at the lateral, third, and fourth ventricles. It's kind of in that salmon color. What we're going to do now is walk through the steps of CSF flow one by one. So step one 
CSF is produced by the choroid plexus of each ventricle. And step two, it's going to flow from the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle through the aperture of Monroe, from the third to the fourth through the cerebral aqueduct, and into the subarachnoid space via the foramen of Magendi medially and the foramen of Lushka laterally. Step three, then, the CSF flows throughout that subarachnoid space. And then it's finally absorbed into the dural venous sinus via structures called arachnoid granulations, or villi. Now, I really want to take a closer look at these arachnoid granulations. And essentially, they're growths or outpouchings of arachnoid membrane into the dural sinuses. And that's where CSF is going to enter the venous system. In this magnified view of one granulation, you can see the skull and the meningeal layers. So first we'll see the dura mater here in gray, and then the two sublayers of the dura mater, or between the two sublayers of the dura mater, lies that dural venous sinus, which is seen here in the darker blue. And the arachnoid mater and the pia mater are the next two layers, and then between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater lies that subarachnoid space in pale blue. That space is filled with CSF. Remember that this is the space where we have to place the needle to obtain CSF in a lumbar puncture. Now in this enlarged image, you can really see those villi or granulations kind of poking out into the dural venous sinus, and that's where we're going to see the CSF absorbed. And here's an image just showing a summary of the steps we discussed. Now this flow I've just talked about is really important for the function of CSF, and that kind of free communication of CSF through all the compartments is important to protect against pressure differences inside the skull. Now sometimes there can be low amounts of CSF, and this low volume typically results from CSF leaks from procedures such as lumbar puncture, sometimes from rupture of dilatations of the arachnoid membrane, sometimes post-brain surgery, or even with severe trauma, like a motor vehicle accident. Now, other times, obstruction of the flow or defective absorption of CSF into the dural venous sinus happens. This causes too much CSF, or an accumulation of fluid, in the ventricular space and around the brain. And when this happens, it results in a pathological condition known as hydrocephalus. So you might have heard this called water on the brain, water on the head. Now, essentially, this condition results from an imbalance of production, circulation, and absorption of CSF. It causes an increase in volume and pressure, and as a result, the ventricular space and the head enlarge, as you can see in this image on the right. The next two images are going to show MRIs. So first, we have an MRI of a normal brain with normal appearing ventricles. And this image on the right shows a greatly enlarged lateral ventricles as a result of a backup, so to speak, of CSF into those ventricles. And you can see the compression of brain tissue in the image. In this case, there's likely an obstruction of flow. Now this can be caused congenitally from um, malformation of the cerebral aqueduct, which is common in kids, or obstruction of the apertures through which the CSF flows. That can be due to trauma or viral illness or a tumor. Symptoms of this increased intracranial pressure can include headaches, nausea, vomiting, and sometimes vision changes such as double vision. Hydrocephalus can also be caused by excess production of CSF, so that could happen from a choroid tumor, or it can be caused by impairment of CSF resorption by those arachnoid granulations, and this is seen in viral illnesses such as meningitis, or sometimes due to blockage from a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Today we've covered the anatomy, histology, embryology, and a bit of physiology of the choroid plexus and the cerebrospinal fluid. Thanks for stopping by.